Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God for His goodness. You may be seated as the ushers come through to minister to us. Praise God. As you are doing so, let's join together in Isaiah chapter 54. Hallelujah. Here we are in the very first Sunday of 2018, the very first Sunday of the month. We're going to be recognizing the Lord's Supper and, and honoring His blood and His broken body. And something that is um, very stirred in me is laying hold of the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. And in the, the fullness of our redemption, when we think about our redemption, we think about things that belong to us because of the finished work that Jesus came, was born on this planet as a man. He walked as a man, tempted in every way, yet without sin. He defeated death, hell, and the grave as he went to the cross and he took upon his body the stripes. He defeated sicknesses, authority over us by taking those stripes for us. He took the curse of poverty. He became a curse for us. Through his poverty, we've been made rich. We look at those redemptive truths and what we see is the substitutionary work. We see that he took the place and he took upon him sickness to give to us his healing. He took upon him the curse to give to us the blessing. He took upon himself the poverty to give to us his riches in glory. These, these things are things that are finished. They're done. They're ours. And what Pastor Caldwell always taught and still teaches is that legal side versus the vital side. There's a legal side. Those things in the legal realm are finished. They are ours. They belong to us. Amen? It is, it is uh, counted in the spiritual realm as done. And there are times as we're walking that out that we are having to bring the vital side in line with the legal side. Because we know that belongs to me. And then we see something that's in, the, in our life that's possibly trespassing. And, and what we learn to do is, is to recognize this does not have any right to be in my life. The curse doesn't have any right to operate in my life. The poverty has no right to operate in my life. Sickness has no right to operate in my life. And then my faith goes to work to bring the vital side, or you could say bring into manifestation what the legal side says is mine. In the same way that if you had a contract... And maybe your contract said that if something such and such happens to the air conditioner on your vehicle, you can bring it into the dealer and the dealer will cover that and they will fix it for you. It's in the contract. It's paid for. You don't have to put any, any money out. It will, they will fix it. For instance, when the other vehicle, the MKZ that we had, um, we, right after we had gotten it, uh, when anybody would sit in the passenger side, all of the electronics would quit working. I mean, the air conditioner quit working, a lot of the display quit working, and I was trying to take Kathleen to the prison ministry with me, and every time she would get in the car, I said, we can't go on this trip because nothing's working. It was summer, but, you know, I, I, we had to cancel and take it back to the shop. We had actually, one time it was raining, and the wipers weren't working, and the trunk wouldn't open. I mean, it was wild, and they couldn't explain what had happened. Happened, but you know what? It was covered. Hallelujah. <laughs> so I didn't care. Y'all keep it and I'll drive your loner as long as it takes for you to find out why it's not working. Because it was covered. It was covered in the contract. It was covered in that warranty. And they found it and they fixed it. But, you know, I had to say, this is what's happening. I'm bringing it. For it to be, I had to go through the right processes. I had to have that warranty, go through the process to get them to, uh, to recognize their responsibility in that warranty, right? And so when we recognize what's ours legally, God does not mind us coming to him. He wants us to come to him and have conversations. We've been talking over the last few weeks about prayer. And one of those things in prayer is that God likes for us to come to him and say, Lord, you said in your word. 
He likes that. He, he wants us because it gives us a boldness when we have that confidence in, in our covenant with him, our relationship with him, our contract with him. Lord, you said in your word you'd give me wisdom liberally. So I'm asking for it. I'm laying hold of it. I believe I receive it. I'm not having to come and beg him to give me something that I know he's already provided for me in the covenant. My approach is different because I know it's mine. My approach isn't a begging approach. My approach isn't a needy, desperate approach. My approach is a confident approach that this is covered in the word. I have a word on this. I have the scripture on this. I've, I, I've seen in the word that you already supplied this for me. And so my approach then is a receiving approach, a laying hold approach. I'm coming to receive the manifestation of what's already mine. It's a totally different approach. If you come trying to get something that's already yours, it makes it difficult for God to answer because he's already answered it. And when people pray prayers asking for things that God's already given them, it's like, hello, hello, I've already given it to you. It's already yours. It's already in your account. How can I give it to you when I've already given it to you? I can't give it to you twice. It's already there. It's already in the account. It's already deposited there for you. It's already yours. So then the responsibility, it's all by his grace through faith. Faith accesses and he gives us his very own faith. He gives us his faith to access what is ours through his kindness. Amen. 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 So we need to, to come with that confidence and come the right way knowing what's already ours. There was a woman who used to sing with um, and travel with Amy Simple McPherson. And she, in the later years of her life, um, she was at Pastor Nancy Dufresne's church. And Pastor Nancy Dufresne asked her this question. She said, you know, uh, talking about the prayers of the people during that time. And she said, what was the difference in the way that, that people prayed then? And she said, when we went to prayer, we went with the answer. We went to God with the answer and we came, Lord, you said, and brought that answer to God and that was their approach to him. And, and that's good for us today. That's the right approach today, to come knowing what already belongs to us and to come with a, a, a boldness to say, Father, you desire this for me. You've already given it to me and made it mine through the blood of Jesus, so I lay hold of it. I, I access it. He is not holding anything back from his people. Amen. He's not holding. Not one good thing will he withhold from them Amen. who love him. Not one good thing will he withhold from you. It, not one good thing will he withhold from you. Amen. He wants you to walk in the fullness of it. In our redemption when we look at our redemption we look at these we look at the healing we look at he was made a curse for me we look at the fact that uh, he became sin so that I could be made righteous you know we look at these there is one that God brought to my attention as we were going through that session of Christ our Savior over the Christmas season. There's one that he brought to my attention and he said, that is just as much yours in salvation, in redemption, as anything else. And it's the victory Jesus wrought when he rose from the dead. Victory over every devil. Victory over every, every aspect of sin and the curse. The victory is ours just as much as the righteousness is ours, the blessing is ours, the riches are ours, the healing is ours. He wants you to take that victory, as that he, his victory that he wrought, and he wants you to make it yours. And so Isaiah 54, we're going to look at some scriptures that talk about this as a part of our heritage. I want to look at verse 13. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord. You know, Shelby's not really in there, so I like to read it this way, like a declaration. All your children, I, I say my children, all my children taught of the Lord. And great the peace of my children. Great the peace of my children. I say it like a declaration, but we'll read it with the Shelby's in it. All your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness shall you be established. 
You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it should not, shall not come near you. You know, every time we see these, this word shall, it's a covenant word. It's, it's, it's expressing something that is a legal covenant aspect of ours. It shall not come near you. Terror shall not come near you. You never have to be afraid another day in your life. Fear is contraband. Don't get caught with it. Don't get caught with it. I mean, you know what you do with contraband? You're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not carrying that in my pocket. I'm not putting that in my car. You know, in, in, in Kansas, uh, it is an open carry state. We don't have to have a concealed carry permit to carry uh, a pistol. Uh, but here in Arkansas, you have to have a concealed carry permit. And so, you know, you don't want to cross the line with it in your back pocket. You know, you don't want to cross the line carrying it because what, now it's contraband, right? You got you to walk the legal way with it. And so, you know, if you've got something you're not supposed to have on your person <laughs> and you try to go through uh, into, um, for instance, if you work in the prison ministry, telephones are contraband. Don't forget your phone in your jacket and try to walk through the prison gate because all of a sudden... You, you are under investigation. Why are you trying to carry a phone into the prison? That's contraband. Contraband. Fear is contraband. Fear is contraband to the believer. Don't get caught with it. Get, I mean, get rid of it. So if it comes near you, you just get it off you. I'm not carrying that fear around. That's contraband. It shall not come near me. Amen. Behold, they shall surely gather together. Now he's talking about... They're gathering together, but you won't fear, and terror won't come near you. Well, you have to have some kind of victory to, ha to be ha surrounded. They're gathering together against you, but you're not afraid of them, right. and, and terror is not coming near you. He said, whosoever shall gather together against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the smith that blows the coals in the fire, and that brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster that destroys is a better term. I've created the waster that destroys. And he says, no weapon. In other words, I know everything that, that he's loaded with. I know everything the enemy has. There's nothing that the enemy could bring against you that's going to surprise me. That's going to catch me off guard. That I haven't prepared you for already. No weapon. No weapon, no weapon. Is that an absolute? Yes. I mean, that, that disqualifies every weapon against you. There's not one that can come through the filter of no weapon. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. He didn't say it wouldn't be formed. But when, it's, when you're staring down the nose of it, you stare with confidence and with a boldness that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. That's not going to work against me. That's not going to prosper against me. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment or you could say criticism. Will there be tongues that rise against you in criticism and judgment? Yes, but you don't have to let them move you. You don't have to let them cause you to be unnerved or disquieted. Why? Because every tongue that shall rise against you in criticism or in judgment, you shall condemn or prove it to be wrong. This is the heritage. The heritage. The inheritance. This belongs to us. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Now, you and I are even more than servants. We're sons. If this was applicable under the old covenant for the servants, how much more for you and I, this and more? This and more. This confidence, this victory, this protection, this keeping, and more. Amen? In Luke chapter 10, and again, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He is delegating authority to his disciples. And this was before he had gone to the cross, before he had established 
the redemption that was available, but this authority was his and his as a righteous man on the earth and as the anointed son of an anointed uh, man on the earth, anointed with the Holy Spirit, he delegates to his disciples and he says, Behold, verse 19 of Luke 10, Behold, I give unto you power. That word power is the word authority. The Weiss translation says, I give you authority to advance. Authority. Authority over or to advance over, to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, at first you think he's just talking about snakes, but he brings out that he's talking about demonic influences over all. Can you, is there anything that doesn't fit under that category of all? All the power of the enemy. Authority over all the power of the enemy. And that word power where it's concerning the enemy is the word dunamis. All, and the word dunamis is the same as explosive power, uh, power to work things. Power, power, um, it's not authority. It's, it's, it's like a, the, the dunamis that the Holy Spirit brings to us is the miracle working power, the, the explosive power of God. He says, I'm giving you authority over anything the enemy can try to do. Anything he can try to work, I give you authority over it. That means you can stop it. No, you're not doing that here. No, we're not letting that. We're not exercising that here. Peace reigns in my house. Amen? The blessing governs me. The blessing governs me. The curse doesn't gain any, any momentum here. The blessing governs me. And so he says, I give unto you authority to advance or to tread on serpents and scorpions and authority over all the work, the power of the enemy, and nothing, no thing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Glory to God. Glory to God. This is ours. And even a greater establishing delegated authority because Jesus has gone to the cross and triumphed and taken and defeated the one, destroyed the one who had the power of death. Let's read that, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and let's read verse 15. I want you to see that this is just as much yours as every other aspect of redemption belongs to you, victory belongs to you. It's his victory. Sometimes we get the idea that I, I need my victory. No, I want his victory. Amen. He has given me his victory like he's given me his blessing. Like he's given me his righteousness. He took my sin and gave me his righteousness. He took my defeat and gave me his victory. The victory that he wrought. You know, Jesus did not need victory. He did not come to the earth and walk the walk that he walked and obey God the way he obeyed him to give himself a victory. He already had the victory. He was already in a position of victory. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. He had always been in a position of victory. He did not need victory. But I did. I needed victory. And I could not attain victory on my own. There was no way I could get the victory that I needed to walk in. So he came and got me his victory and gave me access to his victory. Colossians chapter 2. Glory to God. Let's begin in 13. You being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled, spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing 
over them, triumphing over them in it. In it could be in himself, as my center column reference says, or in the cross, as some other translation says. He triumphed over the demonic powers that were exercising the authority that Adam had given to the devil. Do you remember that when Adam sinned, God came down and had a conversation and explained to Adam and Eve what was going to transpire because of their action of disobedience. He said, because you've eaten of this tree, this is what's going to happen. And he said to the woman, you're going to have this and experience this labor, this, this difficulty in childbearing. He said to the man, you're going to have to, to dig out of the dust and the sweat of your brow to, to labor, to toil out of the ground. It, it wasn't as much of a punishment as an explanation of the punishment that had occurred already because of their action. Let me explain what you've done now. Now you're going to have to toil. Now you're going to have to struggle. You were under the blessing, but you're not under the blessing anymore. The curse has been activated because when you sinned, death entered and the curse came in. And, and now this is what it's going to be like under the curse. She's going to have difficulty in childbearing. And, and then he spoke to the serpent and he said, listen, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. And that word head means dominion. Where did he get dominion? God didn't give him dominion. God didn't create the earth and give the serpent dominion. How did he get the dominion? Who gave, who, who had the dominion? God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. Psalm chapter 8 says, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him, you have given him dominion over all the works of your hands. You've created him just to be a little bit lower than you and you've given him authority over. There's not anything on the earth that's not under his dominion. And then Hebrews chapter 2, it says, but we see not yet all things put under our feet, but we see Jesus. So all things might not be under the feet of natural man, but if you're in Christ, we see Jesus. In Christ, it's under my feet. As, when I take my place and I live for my position in Him, remember, you are here. You find that map and you look for the arrow on the map that tells you where you are. You are in Christ. Identify yourself in Christ and deal with that situation because in Christ, we see Jesus who is crowned with glory and honor and all things are put under His feet. All things are put on. Jesus said after, after he had risen from the dead and this victory, this spoiling of principalities and powers had taken place, this triumph over them in the cross and in himself with this triumph, he raises from the dead and he tells the disciples that something that there is no way they have knowledge of except that they get it revealed to him, by him. He says, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Like, what? What? There's no way they could have known that. This is Jesus. You know, they, they didn't have the full revelation of what had just taken place. When he went and suffered in hell the penalty of sin and paid the price and was justified in the spirit, God raised him back to life. Glory to God. And he rose up in hell, a righteous man walking around in hell. And he said, you have some keys and I think they belong to me now. And he took the keys of death and he took the keys of hell, of the grave, and he rose victorious, triumphing. This says he made a show. He made a show. He didn't quietly whip the devil. He didn't quietly triumph. He triumphed. And, and da, 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 I mean, he had the whole march. He had a triumphant procession, a triumphal procession, victorious, victorious. Come on, they're shouting, who is the king of glory? Who is the king of glory? He says, open up you gates, because I've, I've got a parade coming. Glory to God. He went into that aspect, that region, Abraham's bosom, and he preached deliverance to the captives. And he led captivity 
captive. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He triumphed. That's my triumph. Listen, he went, he, he died my death. He suffered my penalty. That victory is mine too. You, you've got to personalize this. What, what, what causes you to receive the full measure and the benefit of it is when you say, like, like Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. See, he's, he's, this is personal. I am crucified together with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it is not I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Romans chapter 6 says that we've been buried with him in baptism. See how personal that is? That I see myself buried. We've been raised up together with him in the newness of life. I see myself raised up from spiritual death into spiritual life. I'm alive unto God. It, my life is hidden in Christ. Amen? Amen? In that same way, I've got to see that victory that he wrought over death. That's my victory. I have victory over death. That victory over death is my victory. He, get, he, he didn't need it. He didn't come get it for himself. He came and got it so he could give it to me. He came specifically to the, to the earth and walked through the work of redemption to give it to us. And that victory is mine. I know you want to sing right now, didn't you? Everybody, how many of you just wanted to sing, victory is mine? Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. <laughs> that you just, it just comes up in your heart sometimes. Glory to God. I want to read this from the Weiss translation. It says, Having stripped off and away from himself the principalities and authorities, he boldly made an example of them, leading them in a triumphal procession in it, in the cross, in himself. Glory to God. The Weymouth says, the hostile princes and rulers, he shook off from himself. Now, both of those give the idea that they are, they are on him. They're attacking him. They are, they are trying to whip him. They are trying to defeat him. They are, they are coming against him. It says in both of these translations, and, and, and these are very close, especially the Weiss translation to the original, having stripped off and away from himself. The Weymouth says he shook them off. He shook off from himself the hostile princes and rulers. So you remember when, when Samson, the, the, all the Philistines would come and they would all just jump on Samson and he would just stand up and shake them off, right? That's what Jesus did. And all these de demonic attack, the princes and the, the principalities and these powers, these rulers of darkness, are all on him thinking, we got him, we got him, we got him, we've whipped him. You know the devil thought, I have, I have succeeded in, in defeating the Son of God. They knew who Jesus was. They kept meeting him in church saying, what are you doing here? We know who you are. They'd meet him when he was coming to set somebody free and they would argue with him. That legion said, I adjure you. And he said, shut up, come out. So the enemy could not figure, it said, had the princes of this world known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't understand how God was working this salvation with the righteous Son of God in a human form legally. They couldn't understand how, they thought if I take him to the cross and we kill him, if we kill him and, and, and he, we are, we're able to take him out of the way. We have succeeded because God doesn't have any other plan, right? But the whole time, it was the plan of God. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, Isaiah says. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? Because through his justification, many servants would be brought to God. Many people would be made righteous. Amen? This victory, he triumphed over them in it. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 2 talks about this victory over death. This is a complete victory. This is a spiritual victory, and it will affect the natural conditions of our life when we begin to 
to wield this victory like a, 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 and, and operate from this position of victory because it's an eternal victory. It, it will never be turned uh, around. This victory is established. This victory is eternal. It will never be turned into a defeat. The enemy's never going to, I mean, he's going to try, but he will never be able to succeed against the victory that Jesus wrought when he rose from the dead. He will never be able to, uh, to affect that victory or to turn that victory into a defeat. It will never happen. This victory is an eternal victory. And if we'll learn how to live in it and learn how to walk in it and learn how to, to use it in our life, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm walking in the victory. That's my victory. I'm, I'm, I'm positioning myself in that victory. You know, when a, a prize fighter is the champion, they're not fighting to get the belt. They're fighting from the position of I'm already the champion. It gives them an edge. The contender has to gain ground because it's like he's fighting from the down trying to come up. I'm just the contender. I'm trying to get something. We aren't contenders. Right. We are more than conquerors. Amen. We're already possessors of the belt. Amen. We are already possessors of the title. We're already possessors of the victory. Fight that way. Stand. Your resistance isn't a resistance to try to get anything. Your resistance is just holding your ground. When you've done all to stand, stand there for. Take your place in Christ. Take your place in his victory and say, no, resist the enemy. Resist. Take your place and learn how to let that victory manifest in your life. Hebrews chapter 2. Let's look at verse 12. I'm sorry, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy. Render inoperative is the correct form of the definition of that word. Render inoperative him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Just in case you're wondering who had the power of death, it brings it clear here. Past tense had the power of death. Jesus came and took part of flesh and blood, came in the fashion and form of a man so that he could die and in his death destroy the one that had the power of death and deliver them, verse 15, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The Living Bible says slaves to constant dread. We're no longer slaves to dread. We're no longer in bondage to the fear of death. Why? Because I am in Christ and in Him death has been destroyed. Death has been destroyed for me. He has tasted death for me. He's tasted death for me. Verse 9 says that. He has tasted death for every man. It uses that word taste because it's identifying the physical senses. When you and I exit this physical body, we will not die. If we have received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life, we have eternal life abiding in us now, and we may exit our body, but we won't die. We won't die. Amen. Why? Because we're alive. We're spiritually alive. We may physically exit this body, but we will be absent, with the, with, uh, absent from the body, but present with the Lord. We've got to solidify that in our thinking. Because I'm not afraid of death. I'm not going to go before my time. I'm going to finish and accomplish everything that God has called me to do. Amen. And I'm going to live the long, satisfying life He desires for me to have. Amen. But I will not fear death. Amen. Because I have victory. Jesus has tasted death and destroyed him that had the power of death. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. 
Revelation chapter 118, Jesus makes a declaration of this victory that he has attained. He says, I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have, I have the keys of hell and of death. How did he get them? He triumphed. His victory. He defeated the one who did have it and he took that victory and obtained that victory for you and I. So when we look here from God's perspective, that's why it's important for us to spend time in the New Testament. Spend time letting these, these letters, these revelations uh, in the New Testament identify us as to who we are in Christ. It is important for us to see ourselves in the new covenant realities, the new creature that we are in Christ Jesus. We're, Jesus has fulfilled the law. He, has, he, ha, he is the, our jubilee. He is our feast of tabernacles. He is. He, he is all of the fulfillment of those things. I don't have to give my attention to natural earthly celebrations when I have my celebration in Him. Yes. You know, one of the things that Pastor Ron has been talking about on Wednesday nights was uh, the, the question came to him, what's the difference between faith under the Old Covenant and faith in the New Testament? And, and the faith of God is the same faith, but the way it works is different because of the, the, the creature that you are. Under the old covenant, all they could do was have faith under the law of sin and death. They had to have faith in the law and their works. But they, and they were limited in their approach to God and limited in the way they could work faith in, in that same way. And so when, when Abraham, he, he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But you and I believe God and we're made righteous. Do you see why? The difference is because the blood has been shed and the, the new creature has been born. We're born again. And in the born again, it doesn't have to just be accounted to you. Faith just doesn't have to be accounted to you for righteousness. When you're born again, faith makes you righteous. We go from, righteous, from faith to faith and the, the righteousness which is of faith. So faith is working in me to walk in greater levels of righteousness as I grow in faith. Do you see the difference? The faith isn't different. It's the way it works in our life is different because we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. We're in Christ. We're born again. And because of that, I don't have to give my attention to festivals and feast days and all of these natural Jewish customs. I'm, I'm not Jewish. I'm redeemed. I'm not Jewish. I'm redeemed. I'm a, I am in Christ. That's what I want to be looking at. That's, I want to be highly skilled in that. Yes. Now, I know this is experience, and we don't preach experience for doctrine, but I am blessed by the testimony that Jesse Duplantis gives of his experience where he went to heaven. He said the Lord took him to heaven, and he saw different things and had conversations. And, and, and one of the things that he said is that people are still in school there, that there are, people are going to classes and learning. I don't want to go to kindergarten when I get to heaven. <laughs> Y'all, I, I don't want to be in the first grade. <laughs> Sitting in the kitty chairs with my sippy cup, y'all. Okay? Pre-K, Pre yeah. No, I want to be, I want to be in the know. And how do we get in the know? We let the Word of God reveal to us now. It, the prayer that the Holy Spirit prays through these Ephesians prayers and the Colossians prayers, that's inspired by the Holy Spirit, is that we would, that God would give unto us the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, revelation knowledge, that we would, we would know, that we would know, that we would know the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus so that we can experience what is ours as inheritance in the saints of light 
so that we can know what is that exceeding greatness of his power towards us. The way that we walk in it is to know it. And that's true here in the New Testament. We are new Testament believers. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We deal with everything in our life from our position in Christ. We take our place in Christ, which is a position of victory. It's a position of overcoming. I'm not trying to overcome. I have overcome in Christ because he overcame it for me. So I'm taking my place in that, and through that, I'm going to walk out the manifestation of that victory. Amen? Amen? Amen. I'm taking, I'm, it's, a, it's an approach that is in line with the Word. It is, uh, it is the perception that is in, illuminated by the Word of God. I see myself as more than a conqueror. Oh, but you don't feel like more than, not asking what I feel like. Now go check my feelings to determine if I am more than a conqueror. My feelings are not safe guides. They are not accurate indicators of my victory. So what do I do with them? I tell them to submit to what the word of God says. The word of God says that I am more than a conqueror. So you know what that means? Ha, 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 ha. Woo, glory, I've got the victory. People say, well, your situation, you ought to be crying. Not crying. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Praise God I've got the victory. I'm going to make my feelings submit to what the word says. I'm going to make my thoughts submit to what the word says. The word says this victory is mine, that death has been defeated. Glory to God. Here we see in Colossians chapter 1, we're seeing ourselves in line with what the Word of God says about us. Verse 13, we'll start in 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So you know what then? You call yourself, I am able to be a partaker of this inheritance. He, the Father has made me able. He's made me able to partake of the inheritance. Amen? Amen. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? Amen. That word means dominion. Darkness has no dominion in our life. Darkness, depression has no dominion in your life. Fear has no dominion in your life. Lack has no dominion in your life. Anything that darkness works doesn't have dominion in your life. Why? Because the Father has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and has translated us. That word translated means to transfer, to remove from one place to another. He has removed me from the place where darkness had dominion over me. And he has moved me into the place where I am governed by love. It says, into the kingdom of his dear son. The Amplified says, the son of his love. The word dear is the word, the God kind of love, the word agape. He has translated me, completely moved me into where his love dominates. Dominion, the kingdom, the dominion of his love. His love dominates me. God's love dominates me. God's love governs me. It's the dominion I am under. I am submitted under His love. It governs the way I act. It governs the way I think. It governs my conversation. The love of God governs me. And yet, at the same time, I am governed by love. The way that He deals with me is through His love. The way that He interacts with me is through His love, which is a supplying love a providing love, a helping love. God so loves that He gives. He gives unto me. From the Father comes every good and perfect gift He gives unto us. All things that pertain unto life and godliness He's given unto us. Amen. Why? Because He loves us and we're in the dominion of that love. That love is governing my life. And that means it's supplying it's providing, and it's keeping me in the victory. Hallelujah. 1 John 5, 
So we're translated into a place where love governs and the darkness has no authority. Darkness has no authority, so don't give it any. Don't give it place. The Bible says, give the devil no place. Don't give place to the devil. And that word place is the word topos. And it means a strategic point. You don't give the devil high ground by putting your thoughts on worry. Don't give him any place. Keep your thoughts on things above. Keep your thoughts in line with Philippians chapter 4. Whatsoever things are good. Whatsoever things are honest, just, true, of good report, if there be any praise, if there be any virtue, think on these things. Why? Because that keeps God in the position where His peace that passes all understanding can guard your heart and mind. But if you take your mind and put it over on worry, then you're given place. You're given advantage. You're given the devil the high ground, a strategic point of entry. And so... As long as we stay in our position of victory and maintain that position, and if we, if we let it slip, just go back to our victorious Savior and He'll put us back in the position of victory. Get back in that position. Amen? So 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes. This word overcome means to conquer. Yes. Whatsoever is born of God conquers. It also means to defeat. Whatsoever is born of God defeats the world, the world system, anything in the world. It also means to subdue. Whatsoever is born of God subdues. Well, that's what God said in Genesis chapter 1. He told Adam and Eve, subdue, take dominion. Well, you know, that's true in Christ. He has given us authority. He's delegated authority to us. He wants us to take our place and subdue. You will never be victorious considering yourself as a victim. So whenever the and opportunities come to you and I every day to take the victim seat, to sit in the victim chair, to, to let the victim hat be put on our head, to let the victim sticker be stuck on our, our shoulder. Rip that sticker off your shoulder, throw that hat down, and get out of that seat. You are not the victim. You are not the victim. You are not the victim. In any situation, don't take that place. You don't have to take that place. You're not the victim. You are victorious. Hold that position. Nope, nope, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I have victory in Christ Jesus. Whatsoever is born of God subdues. So I'm going to take my authority and I'm going to subdue this situation. I'm going to subdue it. I'm going to turn it. Whatsoever is born of God conquers, defeats, subdues, gets the victory. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith is the victory. It goes on to talk about specifics of our faith. It says, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So faith in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God who came, born of a virgin, tempted in every way like we have been, and yet without sin who went to the cross spotless and sinless as the Lamb of God and poured out His blood on that cross, took the stripes on His back, became sin for us. Do you see what it's telling us about believing? He that believes that Jesus is the Son of God, this is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Well, the Spirit, it says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus offered Himself unto God without spot by the help of the eternal Spirit. The Spirit was there as Jesus offered Himself on the cross, witnessing His death was a legal, righteous 
the death of a righteous one in the substitutionary work for the unrighteous. The Spirit was there and He witnessed it. So He can take the stand for me. And He can say, Michelle has been crucified with Christ. And the devil say, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved. Oh, wait a minute, I've got, I've got testimonies. I've got eyewitnesses. When Jesus was there hanging on the cross, I was crucified with him. I didn't see you on the cross. I don't see any scars in your hands. Oh, oh, oh. Let me tell you, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Because when he went to the cross, he did that for me. He did that for me. And I have faith in it. And this is the victory over that sin, over that accusation that I've not been saved. This is that victory. Why? Because when he died on the cross for, he died on the cross for me. I've been crucified with Christ. Amen. I was there with him. You might not see it in my hands, but in my spiritual, so my spiritual account, I've been to the cross. And I have a witness who will take the stand. And you know what else? I've been buried with him. I've, I went to the tomb with Jesus. When they laid Jesus in the tomb, they laid me in the tomb with him. Oh, Michelle, you are not even old enough to have been in the tomb of Jesus. You've never even physically been over to Israel to walk in the tomb. But I was in the tomb the day they laid Jesus in the tomb. I was laid in there with him and I have evidence. I have somebody who can take the stand for me. The water of my baptism will speak for me. Because when I went down in that baptismal water, I went to the grave with Jesus in the, in, the, in the spiritual reality of God. Not just a thought. I went to the grave. I was buried with him and I have faith in that. I've died to sin. Sin no longer has dominion over me. Why? I've died to sin. I've been buried to sin. The old Michelle is dead. Hallelujah. She was a mess. She was a mess. Y'all be glad. You know the new AD version versus the BC version, before Christ version. I have died. I have died to sin. I have died to lying. I have died to criticism. I have died to hatred. I have died to the lust of my flesh. I've died to those things. How did I do it? I was buried with him. I went to the tomb and I have faith in that and my faith overcomes. This is the victory that overcomes. You see, we're not just talking about pulling a scripture out and saying, well, uh, da, 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 which we do that but it's rooted in this. It's rooted in who I am in Christ. It's rooted in my faith that he died and I died with him. He was buried and I was buried with him. And the evidence is the spirit and the water and the blood. The blood speaks better things of me. It speaks better things of me. The blood testifies that I've been made righteous. I'm made righteous and justified by the blood. If anybody tries to say, if the devil ever tries to come against me and say, you're not the righteousness of God, we just put the blood on the witness stand and the blood says, she has been made righteous. It witnesses for me. I have faith in that. Do you see then this victory that overcomes, this victory is, is, uh, is our faith in the finished work of what Jesus has done for us and all of the other things that we use our faith to receive, which would include our, our, our finances, our relationships, those other things that we apply our faith to are established on the fact that I have faith that I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. I am not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. I'm righteous. I'm the daughter of God. I'm a child of God. I am in authority in Christ Jesus. I have authority on this earth. I have dominion on this planet. When I say go, it goes. When I say come, it comes. Glory to God. When I say I'm blessed, the blessing is working. Hallelujah. Why? Because this is the victory. This is the victory. How did we get this victory? 
We don't have to work up this victory. We don't have to obtain this victory. We just have to walk in the victory he gave us. It's his victory, but it's our victory. It's his victory. He worked it. That's why it says we're more than conquerors. You may have heard this story before, but Brother Copeland always tells this story about the, the fighter who went and he fought that, that boxing match. And he won and defeated that opponent. They raised his arm and they declared him the winner. They declared him the conqueror. And they handed him the belt and they handed him the check. And he walked home, walked in the door, and there his wife, she took that check and she said, thank you. She's more than a conqueror. She didn't have to fight the battle. She didn't have to take any of the punches. She didn't have to endure any of the difficulty of the boxing match. But she got all the reward of that victory. You're more than conquerors. More than conquerors. More than conquerors through him. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 6. Hallelujah. Verse 11. I want you to hear this tone where it's talking to us about the armor of God. It says actually in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So it says that with the armor of God, with, with the equipment, God has provided for you, you are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're able to stand. Notice it didn't say the powers of the devil. Why? Because he's already given you the victory over those. Wiles means strategies, his plans, his schemes. And with the armor on, you'll see all those coming. You'll be able to stand against them all. It says that you are able to stand. And then it goes on. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He didn't tell you to be afraid of that list. He didn't tell you to be intimidated by that list. He says that you stand against them all. We wrestle against them, and it's not a, a, a wrestling to get victory. It's a holding our ground of the victory that is already ours. It says that in verse 16, above all, which means taking and covering all, putting above everything in your life the shield of faith, wherewith all, wherewith you shall be able, notice again, you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This is the victory that overcomes even our faith. Take this shield, because with the shield you can stop, you can put out, you can quench, you can e extinguish all of the flaming missiles, one translation says, that the enemy sends your way. Do you remember when the Patriot missiles were being used over in the Gulf War? And they were, this was the first time that they had shown on national TV things, missiles being launched. I was intrigued because, you know, there's, I'm like, that's a missile that just got launched. And they would launch, the enemy would launch their Scud missiles. And those Scud missiles would be launched and immediately the allies, the, the uh, armed forces from America would have the Patriot missile. And it would lock onto that Scud missile and they would launch the Patriot missile and in midair the Scud was just put out, of, demolished, put out of, out of commission. Praise God. That's what faith does. This is the victory. That's what your victory does. Your victory through the application of faith. Anytime the enemy launches a missile, you can just blow it up in midair. So it doesn't ever reach its target. It doesn't ever cause any damage. It doesn't ever do any, any uh, advancing against you. You're able to quench all. You're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is a victory stance. 
This is standing in the victory that's already ours. 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to see, I said it before, but I'm going to say it again. This victory is an eternal victory. It's more than just victory for a, a, a natural situation. It will overflow into that. But we've got to go down to the root of that victory and pull it into manifestation in our life. And it will overflow into the natural areas that we need victory in. Verse 55 of 1 Corinthians 15. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. Well, wait a minute. I've been made righteous. He became sin for me. So the sting of death doesn't have any, any way to touch me anymore because I am not a sinner by nature. I am the righteous by nature. I am redeemed. So the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God. Thanks be to God which gives us you know, every day that you open this verse up and you read it, it makes itself present tense. It will never be has given. It's always freshly given. Amen. He has fresh victory, everyday victory. Amen. Every day you read it, it becomes new again. It becomes present tense all over again. He gives. That's a continual giving. That's a present progressive. It's present and it's continually continuing. He, he gives and gives and gives and gives and gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Why? Because you've got continual victory. Yeah. Be steadfast in that victory. Unmovable. How can you be unmovable? I've got the victory. Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He's talking about an eternal victory. In 2 Corinthians, just a couple of pages over, chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes the manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. He always causes us to triumph. Not only does He continually give us victory, but He always causes Causes. God is causing some things in your life. Amen. He's causing you to triumph. He always causes you to triumph. Stay in that place. Amen. Stay in that place where this can work and always causing. And listen, we can get in a place if we agree with the circumstances, we put ourselves out of the position where victory works. If we agree with the circumstances, if we give place to the fear Brother Copeland tells a story about when they were flying uh, an airplane. He and his wife, she was, Sister Gloria, was flying to get some time in the air. And they just decided to fly down to this little uh, place in Texas that there was nobody even at the landing field. And so they drove down and they got out and they went and saw something. And then they came back to the plane and they were going to start the plane and it wouldn't start. And so the, the magneto switch was on and he went out and uh, he said, he went through it like four times. Now it's off, right? It's off. That switch is off. It's off because it was a prop, a prop plane and if he touched it and it was on, it could have cut him, his head off. It could have killed him. And so he said four times, it's off, right? She said, the switch is off. Okay, the switch is off, right? The switch is off. And they went through that and he barely turned that propeller and it came, it started up, and he said it was like one in a hundred million chances that he didn't get hit by that propeller. And he said it didn't bother him at the moment. And they had found out later that the, the wire from the switch inside at the, the controls to the outside, the wire was broken, and so it had been on the whole time. And, and yeah. And so he said, it didn't bother me till I got up in the air. And all of a sudden, he said, I could feel. He said, it was like fear was 18 inches off my shoulder. Yeah. These thoughts of fear were standing right out here saying, you could have been killed. And, and, you know, trying to bring him into fear. And he spoke to it and said, you get away from me. I'm not going to fear. I wasn't fearing when I was down there. And the propeller started moving. 
I'm not going to fear now. And, uh, but he had to resist it. He had to stand against it. But you know what that told me? Fear comes. It doesn't necessarily enter in until we give it place, until we open up our mouth and take it. You, Jesus said, take no thought by saying in Matthew chapter 6. Remember him saying that? He said, take no thought by saying. So, so I own that thought. I receive and I take into my, my possession a thought when I say it. If it comes just to my mind and I haven't put my mouth in agreement with it yet, I can still cast that down and take it captive. I can still take that captive. No, I don't think that way. I am far from oppression in Jesus' name. I will not fear. Like Brother Copeland did, he resisted it with his words. Kelly Copeland uh, talks about when her daughter, they came and said she has meningitis. She, there's, she's probably not going to live. And uh, all these other children have died. She said it was like fear was standing right there. And she had to resist it with her mouth. I will not fear. And she said when she resisted it out loud verbally, she felt that fear push away from her. It backed off. When we take our victory, we're going to be saying it. I have the victory over this. You don't have to feel it to take it. Take it. Take it by saying. Don't take the wrong thing by saying the wrong thing, but take the right thing. Take your victory by saying it. I have the victory that is mine in Christ Jesus. This is the victory that overcomes the world. This thing will not take me under. I will overcome it. And keep it in your mouth. Keep it in your possession by keeping it in your mouth. Keep saying that you have the victory. Why? Because we're bringing what's vitally ours into manifestation through our faith. Praise God. As the ushers come and prepare to uh, pass out the communion elements, I want us to read this final verse over in Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, let's look at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, God's chosen? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, who, ever, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So we've had three questions. Who's going to lay anything to, uh, to charge against me? Who's going to condemn me? Who's going to separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sore. We're talking about circumstances, real life situations. Go ahead, gentlemen. Real life situations and circumstances that come against us. Are any of these things going to be able to separate us from this love that is governing us? This love that gives us the victory? And then... There is a quote in verse 36 from an Old Testament scripture from the book of Psalms. And this quote says, As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Oh, what a sad state to be in. What a, what a sad condition to be in. For your sake, Lord, we are killed all the day long. I'm going through this. I'm coming up <laughs> on the rough side. Tear that mountain down. This rough side of the mountain perception is a sense knowledge perception. It's not a revelation knowledge perception. It's not based on who we are in Christ. It's not based on this victory that is ours in him. This victory over death, victory over, over the grave, victory over hell. Jesus has won the victory. And you've got to continue to verse 37 because he starts out verse 37 putting 36 to rest. He says, no, 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 we're not killed all day long. We're not accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We're not coming up the rough side of the mountain. We're not strangers in a pilgrim land uh, just barely making it through. 
We're not in this struggle, defeated, hold on mentality. No, in all these things, in all these circumstances, in all these situations, in all of these attacks, in all of these encounters, we are more than conquerors. You've got to take that role from the beginning. The moment you recognize there is adversity, the moment you recognize there's a situation and it looks difficult, you just put yourself in the celebration of triumph. You just put yourself over in that place. I'm going to, I have the victory already. I'm in Christ and I am more than conqueror in every one of these situations. In all these things. In all these things. Tribulation. In tribulation, I'm more than a conqueror. In distress, I'm more than a conqueror. In persecution, I'm more than a conqueror. In famine, I'm more than a conqueror. You see, more than a conqueror is going to have supply in the famine. All of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him. There we go again with the love. Where, where are we? We're in the kingdom of the love of God, the kingdom of the Son of God's love. Love governs me. And love governs me with victory. Love governs me by giving me victory. We are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am, more, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's where our victory comes from, because God so loves us. God so loves us. The victory is, is an expression of His love. And He wants us to walk in it. And the way that we walk in it is by faith. By faith, we take it. By faith, we own it. We possess it. We, I want you to leave here today possessing the victory of Jesus Christ. His victory. I want you to leave here today as a possessor that you're holding in your possession the victory that Jesus Christ wrought for you. And one way for us to do that is to recognize His body and His blood. He said to do this in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you don't have to turn there. Go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to read what Jesus dealt with the Apostle Paul concerning the communion. He said, I have received, the Apostle Paul says, I have received the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Father, we recognize the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This body was broken to make me whole. Say that with me. This body was broken to make me whole, to give me victory in my flesh, in my physical body. I receive now. Every spiritual supply, every, spiritual supply, every, natural, supply, every natural supply that this victory brings me. That this victory brings me. In, Jesus In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. you may receive. Hmm? Oh, glory. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I receive restoration. Oh, Lord, I receive energy. I receive adjustments, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I receive wholeness, 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 wholeness. Restoration. Hallelujah. Restoration. I thank you, Lord. Every cell of my blood is restored. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Every organ in my body is restored. I thank you, Lord. My eyes don't grow dim. 
I thank you, Lord, for the mobility of my joints. I thank you, Lord. I just receive wholeness, healing, healing, healing in every area of my body. I take it now. I take it now, and I call my body healed and whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not saying that because I'm sick. I'm saying that because I'm taking it. I don't need to wait to get sick to get healed. Just take your healing now. Take some. Take it. Let it, let it go to every fiber of your being. Take that healing. Take that wholeness. Take some emotional wholeness. Take that emotional wholeness. If there's any broken places in your mind, any broken places in your emotions, any areas that you're broken, this wholeness is yours. We take it, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for, for making me whole. Hallelujah. You keep me in perfect peace. Perfect peace. Hallelujah. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Declare this with me. Father, this blood has justified me. It has made me righteous. Through this blood, I am a covenant child. Through this blood, I exercise authority. I walk in dominion and I receive of every benefit of your covenant with me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may receive. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for the dominion and the authority. Thank you, Lord, that you have given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for everything that is ours as children of God, as heirs and joint heirs. Father, I ask you to reveal to each and every one of us the dimensions of our covenant, the inheritance that belongs to us, and how to walk in it to your glory. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You may be seated for just a moment. Praise God. Praise God. If you would, please just close your eyes and just bow your head for a moment. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, everything that we've talked about is the benefit of our salvation. And it is ours because we made a choice, a decision to receive what Jesus did for us on the cross. And without making that choice, it's impossible to receive of it. But it's so easy by making that choice to have the full benefits of everything he died to give to us. If you're here today and you've never made that decision to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, I want to give you the opportunity to choose him today. If you're here today and maybe you once walked with God and you're desiring to return and to get back into fellowship with Him and to repent of walking away and walking after the things that diverted you. If you're here today and you would like to say, I want to recommit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pray for you today. Either one of those. If you're here today and you want to make the decision to receive Him as Lord, would you lift your hand so that we can pray with you? Or if you're here today and you need to recommit your life to Him, would you lift your hand and let us pray with you today? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. With every heart confident of your relationship with Him, let's just declare this out loud together. I receive, I receive the, victory the victory of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ. as my victory. I receive every aspect of His finished work as mine. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the victory. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, let's stand to our feet. Have you received today from the Word? I know you have. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
We are going to be back tonight at 6 o'clock, Wednesday at 7. Glory to God. I encourage you, our word supply, all of the CDs and DVDs in the foyer are available as our seed to you. We want to sow into your life the word. And if you have, how many of you have been feasting on some of those CDs already? You can every week stop at the word supply and get a, a new one. Uh, get a couple of them each week. Uh, we ask that you limit it to one or two a week so that we don't run out. If everybody just went and grabbed everything, we might not have enough to go around. But there's plenty more. We keep restocking it continually. So if it's not there, we'll restock it. And uh, we're going to have everything that's available in our libraries available for CD. And so uh, stop by there and get some today. Just check in with the people working the media center so they can know what you've received. And we can keep account of what seed we have in the ground. But we want you to be blessed by the word. Amen. Uh, the podcasts are going to be what has been preached over the last uh, six months to a year. I think the podcast keeps about six months in the archive. What we have done is we've taken all of the, the audio and we're now going to be putting it on our website. If it's not up this week, it'll be up next week. Instead of you having to go to iTunes or go over here, it'll still be in iTunes, but it will also be on the website, kind of like what Keith Moore's church has. They have the videos, the audios, so that you can download it, you can listen to it or watch it from your smart TV. All of our live stream are going to be up there as well. So you'll be able each week to go back and watch that. And then when they turn into a series, we'll put them later on in on the web page as a series so it's available in a lot of different formats we're trying to make it easy access for you so buildfaith.net is where you can find all of that and as well as picking up the cds on your way out praise god well let's declare the vision of our church are you ready the vision of this church is to build people's faith and to frame their world by the word of God, you and I will always be world changers. Praise God. God bless you. Happy New Year.